I'm Pastor Charlie Eldred. Welcome to Fairway Park Baptist Church. Our series in the Gospel of Mark has brought us to chapter 10, and today we're going to discuss verses 32 through 34. In this passage, Jesus teaches his followers an important lesson about what they were about to experience. As we hear the same words today, they provide a reality check for us. So let's learn together what it means to follow Jesus. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Marcos, capítulo 10, versículo 13, 2 y 13, 4. In a moment, we're going to be looking at verses 32 through 34. And I've run out of as much Spanish as I know from my message this morning. I can announce the text, but that's about it. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. Follow along as I read. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. Let's pause here. We'll ask the Lord's blessing on our time as we study this passage together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity to interact with your word in a way that reminds us of how good you are, how great you are, and how desperately we need you. We ask that in these next few moments that you would be our teacher. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Mark pauses his account of Jesus' teaching. Jesus has been teaching about his kingdom. The discussion has centered on how Jesus' kingdom is better than anything else. How his kingdom is entered only by those who are willing to give up everything else. How the rewards that God gives far outweigh the cost of sacrifice. And now, Jesus pauses in that discussion to remind us of something that is equally as important and equally as serious. Jesus communicates, Jesus teaches us the other side of what he is teaching. We might call this a reality check. With all the talk about what is ahead, Jesus wants us to be aware of what must be faced first. And we know how this works. We're familiar with this concept. We love to plan for and talk about retirement. But the reality is that before you can retire, you have to work each day. Each week, each month, each year, until you get to that place of retirement. Or maybe you like to travel, and you can plan uh, for the trip, you can save for the trip, and even when you're finally ready to just be there, you're still in an airplane on your way there, and you're not there yet. Or you're in the car, and it's how much further is it to go? There's that reality check. Yes, there's something that we're looking forward to, but what's happening right now? That's what Jesus is telling his disciples. That's what Jesus is reminding those who follow him, that yes, there's something great ahead, but there's something right now that needs to be faced. And as Jesus is instructing those who are following him in the first century, he's also speaking to us today. Because we have something great that is ahead of us, something to which we look forward, and yet we're not there. 
we need to be reminded of these lessons as well. And as we notice it, we're going to notice two things. We're going to notice that following Jesus is very rewarding. But the other side of that and the companion to that is that following Jesus is emotional. Following Jesus is rewarding, but when we follow him, there are a lot of emotions involved. Would you look at verse 32? Versículo 32. Following Jesus is emotional. They were on the road, going up to Jerusalem. Jesus is leading them, and they're amazed. And there are others who are afraid. Do you hear the emotions that are communicated there? And as we read that in English, we get a very different picture than what Mark is giving us. Because we read that word amazed, and we think that the disciples are just sitting back going, wow, isn't this great? This is wonderful. It's all That's not the picture that, that Mark is trying to paint for us. The word amazed, when used back when the English translation was written, means something different than what it means today. We hear that word amazed, and we think that they're just in awe. But what Mark is communicating to us, what the disciples are experiencing at this moment is confusion. They're bewildered. They're baffled. They're confused. They're not sure what is happening. Because Jesus is talking about a kingdom that is coming, and yet they're on the way to Jerusalem. And if Jesus is talking about a kingdom and blessings and ruling and reigning, how does going to Jerusalem help? Jerusalem is a place that already has a king. In fact, as Jesus is alive, the king is not in Jerusalem. The king is the emperor back in Rome. Going to Jerusalem doesn't seem to make sense. And yet, the disciples are watching as Jesus very determinedly makes his way to Jerusalem. They see him deliberately marching his way to death. They understand that Elijah and Moses have already been speaking to him on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we're told that they spoke to Jesus about his departure, his exodus, his leaving. Moses and Elijah speak to Jesus and remind him that God's plan is for him to be living so that he could give his life for others. And from that time, uh, we're reminded, I think it's Luke who reminds us that Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem and will not be distracted from it. And so they see Jesus marching towards Jerusalem where it doesn't seem to make sense. Going there is, is not the right place to be. We should be gathering uh, people. We should be gathering crowds. We should be gathering attention so that we can build this kingdom. But I want you to notice something. Even though the disciples are confused and they don't have it figured out and they're not sure what's happening, would you notice they kept following Jesus? There will be times in your life that what God is doing does not make sense. And you will be confused. And you will be wondering, what is God doing and how does this fit into the plan? And this doesn't seem to make sense. Keep following Jesus. See, following Jesus involves emotions. And sometimes those emotions are confusion. We're not sure what is happening. You can be confused, but don't let that change your commitment. Don't let that change your decision to follow Jesus. Because following Jesus may be confusing at times, but following anything else makes zero sense. 
but that is not the only emotion that's taking place. Would you notice that while the disciples are amazed or confused, there are others who are following who are afraid. They are just as dedicated. They're just as committed. They're walking the same path, but they're afraid. They see the events taking place around them. They realize that everywhere they go, there is opposition. There's Pharisees or scribes or other leaders who are asking questions and trying to trip Jesus up, trying to accuse him of things that he is not guilty of. They know that by going to Jerusalem, that's not going to help. Because Jerusalem is the exact middle, it is the the hub of all of that opposition. The Pharisees are in Jerusalem. The scribes, the lawyers, are in Jerusalem. The Sadducees are in Jerusalem. The Herodians are in Jerusalem. Going to Jerusalem is just not the right place to be. We go there, we're going to be in trouble. They realize that going to Jerusalem is risky. And let me pause here for a minute. If you're going to follow Jesus, sometimes it's risky. Sometimes there are dangers involved simply because you're associating with Jesus. But would you notice, even though they're afraid, they keep following. They still follow. They knew that they needed to go to Jerusalem. It was getting close to the time when they needed to be there for the Passover, when all the men of Israel would gather in Jerusalem to worship and to sacrifice. They knew the, the, ver- they knew the verses of their scripture. They knew what the prophet Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 53. They knew that there would be a servant who would be bruised and put to grief, whose soul would be made an offering for sin. And they realize this may just be what is going to happen. If they didn't think about that, Jesus certainly knew about it. Jesus knew the things that were said about himself. Peter and John had stood on the banks of the river and heard John the Baptist as he looked at Jesus and says, There is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. They knew that something was in store for this one that they were following. And I'm sure that that message had spread of what had been said about Jesus. And now as those who are following him are following him to Jerusalem, a place where nothing good can happen as far as setting up a kingdom, there are some who are afraid They don't like what might happen there. But they keep following. In spite of their fear, in spite of their worry, in spite of their dread, they keep following Jesus. Now listen, you could be here this morning, and I know that in a room this size with this number of people, there there must be at least one who came here this morning worried about something in the future. Listen, I'm not recommending you do this. But if every last one of you stayed home, I'm not recommending you do that. But if you stayed home and it was only me here speaking, there would still be a person who's worried about the future. We do that, don't we? We're not sure what's going to happen with this event or that situation or that. There are things in the future that concern us. And maybe you're here this morning, there are things in the future that you're not sure how that fits into God's plan. You're not sure why God would do that in that way. You're not sure what lies ahead. And maybe you can feel that tension mounting as things are just moving forward and I'm not sure what's going to happen. Are you going to keep following Jesus? Following Jesus is emotional. There are times when you follow Jesus that you are confused about what is taking place, but you don't have to be confused about Jesus. There are times when you're following Jesus that you may be afraid of what is happening. You may be afraid of what lies ahead, 
but you can keep following Jesus. Even during those emotional times in life, you can keep following Jesus. But would you notice something else? Jesus notices their emotions. Jesus is wise and loving, and he brings his disciples together, and he starts teaching them again. I like that word again. How many of you get it right the first time? Yeah, me neither. Jesus keeps teaching his disciples. This is a lesson they needed to hear over and over and over and over What lesson is Jesus teaching his disciples? Well, I think that as we look at it this morning, we could could say that the lesson is this. Following Jesus is difficult. If we're going to follow Jesus, yes, it's going to involve some emotions that we may not understand. But following Jesus is often difficult. If it were easy... Wouldn't everyone be doing it? Following Jesus is difficult. And as Jesus gathers his followers together, he begins teaching them and showing them some things that indicate if you're going to follow me, there's going to be some difficulty. But in the midst of all of this difficulty, Jesus wants us to notice that there is a deliberate path. It's not just happening to them. There is something very deliberate that is taking place. And what's taking place? Well, we passed by it really quickly in verse 32. Jesus is going before them. Jesus is leading the way. Remember how we said Jesus had his face set like a flint towards Jerusalem? would not be distracted, would not be dissuaded, would not be detoured. Jesus is leading the way deliberately. And please do not forget this. Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew, more than anyone in that group, Jesus knew what lay ahead for him. Jesus knew all of the old Testament scriptures that had spoken about what would take place in Jerusalem. Later, the Jewish people could read back and say, yes, this must have been talking about Jesus, but Jesus already knew that it was talking about the Messiah. He already knew that those passages referring to the Messiah referred specifically to him and that he was living out those predictions. He was living out those picture prophecies. We find them in Psalm 22, verses 6 through 8, when the psalmist describes himself like a worm, a reproach of men, despised by people. Those who pass by just, says they shoot out their lip. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him. He knew what Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, applied to him. When Isaiah talks about giving his back to those who struck him, his cheeks to those who pulled out his beard, not hiding his face from shame or spitting. Jesus knew that and kept going deliberately to Jerusalem. See, following him is difficult because it's a very deliberate path. Jesus knew what lay ahead, and yet he knew that the trip he was taking was necessary. Now, he's already talked to his disciples about this trip. If you look back in the book of Mark to chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, killed, and after three days rise again. He had already been teaching his disciples that this trip was necessary. He needed to be there. We look forward to chapter 9, verse 31. And Jesus has told them that he knows 
and he's telling them so that they will know that this trip is not just necessary, but its outcome is certain. Look at chapter 9, verse 31. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he's killed, he'll rise again the third day. God's plan was already clearly laid out. And Jesus was very deliberately taking each step in turn as he moved along God's path for his life. Jesus is not going to Jerusalem thinking that one thing is going to happen and when he gets there is going to be surprised. Jesus travels to Jerusalem with no delusions about what lies ahead. And he's about to tell his followers exactly what lies ahead. Real, real quickly, look back through verses 32 and 34, and if you want, review all of Mark up to this point. Review it in your mind. Don't like go back and read it. Is Jesus worried? Do we see Jesus scratching his head or you know, fretting? We don't. Jesus is not worried about his path because he knows that it's a very deliberate path that is certain, that is set out, that he can trust and he will follow because he trusts the one who laid out the path. He trusts his Father. Each one of us are here this morning and God has set out a path for our lives. You and I do not need to worry about that path. God has just as clearly laid it out for each one of us as he had laid out Jesus' plan for his life. We can walk as we follow Jesus with confidence. It doesn't mean it won't be difficult. It will be difficult. But even in the midst of difficulty, we can have confidence because we're very deliberately following God's path for our life. But it's more than just a deliberate path. We can know where the path is and still not choose it. Would you notice that Jesus' path is also determined? He's determined to follow it. Jesus knows what is ahead, and what baffles my mind is that he keeps going. Jesus keeps going. He doesn't stop here and tell his disciples, here's what's going to happen, so let's put it to a vote. How many of you really want to keep going? He doesn't do that. He says, this is what's ahead of us, this is what we're facing, this is what will happen, and I'm going. And he starts walking. It's a determined path. Jesus had determined that he would follow that path because he knew that God had deliberately laid it out for him. And even though it was difficult, even though it was filled with many emotions, confusion and fear and work, he was not going to let that stop him from following the path that God had laid out for him. John tells us in John chapter 13 that Jesus, knowing that the time had come, before the feast of the Passover, knowing that he would depart from this world to the Father, and having loved the ones who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. What we find here is a demonstration of Jesus' love. You ask, what did it cost Jesus? Here's what it cost him. Knowing everything that was ahead and saying, but these people here are worth it. I will make it worth it. This is worth delivering them. Jesus knows what is going to happen. Jesus knows what his disciples are about to be witness to. As Jesus speaks to his disciples, he uses eight words, eight verbs. And as he says it, he uses a tense that indicates this is most definitely going to happen. Now, there are those who will say, well, Jesus is speaking so precisely here that Peter or Mark or someone probably just went back afterwards and said, this is what he said, because how else could it fit so perfectly what Jesus was going to face? I'll tell you how. 
because Jesus is all-knowing, and he's the Son of God, and he knew that what had been said would take place, and it did take place, and so he can speak just as confidently about the future as he does about the past and about the present. In Jesus' mind, this has already been accomplished. It's as good as done. The verb tenses that he uses indicates it will most certainly happen. Take a look at what Jesus says would happen. He most certainly, definitely will be handed over to the religious leaders, to those who claimed to be spiritual, to those who claimed to be right with God, the chief priests and the scribes, the ones who knew God's word backwards and forward, he was most certainly going to be given into their custody. And as a result, he most certainly was going to be condemned to die. Jesus says, count on it. It's as good as done. There will be a trial. There will be a verdict. There will be a sentence given. He most certainly, as a result of that sentence, be given to the Gentiles. The Jews in that day could not execute a criminal under their own authority. A person that was uh, slated for execution had to be given into Gentile custody so that the Romans could take care of that death sentence. Imagine how humiliating it would be for a Jew to be given into custody of the Gentiles. But Jesus most certainly would be given over to the Gentiles. He most certainly would then be mocked and humiliated. He most certainly would be scourged, whipped as a prelude to his execution. He most certainly, most definitely, write it down, it's as good as done, it's as good as already having happened, that he would be spit upon as a mark of ridicule and spite. He most certainly definitely, absolutely would be killed. And because of the sentence that was given, because he was handed over to the Gentiles, there would only be one method of execution. It would be crucifixion. And that is not the end. If you've been keeping count, that's seven verbs. And I said there were eight. He most certainly, definitely, absolutely would. Write it down. Rise again three days later. This trip was not going to end with an execution. This trip was going to end in victory. This trip was going to end with a triumphal ending to the process. And yet... Even though Jesus was certain of what was going to take place, even though Jesus was convinced that it would take place, even though Jesus knew that it would take place, his disciples have a hard time understanding that. They're not yet convinced. In fact, in the parallel passage in Luke chapter 18, Luke says they did not, he says they understood none of these things. They did not understand the things that were spoken. And we look at it and say, but how can they not see that? It's just so clearly spelled out. Listen. God has a plan for Jesus' life. Jesus, I know what that plan is, and it's as good as done. But God also has a plan for your life, too. And it's just as clearly spelled out in God's mind as Jesus' path was as he spelled it out to his disciples. But guess what? The disciples didn't understand. Even when they were told this is what's going to happen, they didn't get it. I take a little bit of comfort in that. Because sometimes there are, there are times when God says, here's what I want you to do, and I say, I don't get it. But this is the plan. I don't get it. Here's what I want you to do. What would you want me to do, God? Here's what I want you to do. I don't get it. If I do that, it's going to be hard. 
it's going to be difficult. That, that seems confusing. I'm afraid of what might happen. Wait, following Jesus is emotional. But I still need to follow. Following Jesus may be difficult. But I still need to follow. The path for your life may confuse you. It may frighten you. You may not fully understand exactly why God's asking you to put your foot there at this time for whatever reason. It doesn't, I don't get it. Keep following. He has a plan. He has a path. God has just as clearly orchestrated the steps of your life to the finest detail as he did for Jesus. You realize what that means? It means that there are no accidental events in your life. It means the things that you face, you go, wow, I never thought that was going to happen. God knew it. All those times that you've sat and said, who would have thought? God did. And he planned it out. It also means that when you sit down and say, I have no clue, God does. There are no accidents with God. Nothing has ever taken him by surprise. Nothing has ever occurred that God says, wow, who'd have thought that? No, that's not how God works. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present. There are no accidents. God is never surprised by the events in your life. There are those who will look at that and say, well then, why does it matter what I do? Because God already knows what's going to happen. That, that's not the point. The point is I can move forward with confidence because God knows my path. And if I start wandering away from his path, he has ways to bring me back to it. He knows how he will bring me back to it. But I can move forward with confidence because I know that God knows my path and he will help me find it. He will help me walk it. I don't need to be confused. I don't need to be afraid. I can move with confidence even in the face of difficulty because God has a plan that he's already planned out for me. I can keep going. The path that follows Jesus is emotional. Maybe you are here this morning confused or worried or afraid. Following Jesus is difficult. It may ask more from you than you think you can give. Or it may involve events that you really don't feel prepared for. But that path that follows Jesus leads us directly to God's presence. And it is blessed with God's presence along the way as we see Him providing, protecting, and caring and creating for us the path that He has planned for us. This morning, I'm not sure where you're at in your journey. I don't know what you're facing specifically, but maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're worried. Maybe it seems too difficult. I'm here to encourage you to keep following Jesus. Jesus knew all the details and kept going. Even when we don't know all the details, we can keep going. Even when you don't know the details, you can keep going. When I don't know the details, when I am afraid, I can keep going. Let's keep following Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for an opportunity to be reminded of how great you are, how wise you are, and how comforting you are. Father, I pray for those this morning that are facing confusion. Father, I ask that you would bring calm 
and clarity to their life, to their mind, to their thoughts, so that they will keep following you. There are others who are here this morning and they're afraid of what might be in the future. Again, I ask that you would prove stronger than any doubt or worry that your presence would be sufficient and your grace would be more than enough. Father, as we look at the path to which you've called us, we realize that it involves difficulty. But Father, we do not want to be distracted. We realize that you have deliberately laid out the path, and so we want to determinedly follow you. And then, Father, perhaps there are those this morning who are still trying to make the decision about following you. Would you draw those to yourself who should be following you and yet are not yet? May they look to you as their only hope, their only strength, and find that you have a plan for them that involves their trust being in you alone. We thank you that you are working in our hearts. We ask that you would give us the courage and the strength to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Fairway Park Baptist Church. If you've enjoyed this video, please click the like button. You can also click subscribe and the notification bell. You'll be notified each week when we post new videos. Of course, I would love to meet you in person. Our services start each Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You can learn more about us, directions how to get here, our service schedule. It's on our website, www.fairwaypark.org. And until next time, remember, God tells you what he wants you to know, so you will be the type of person who does what pleases him.